So day one of this was linear permutations. Day two, as I just mentioned, is circular. What we basically do is we attempt to change them from circular to linear is really what you try and do. But when it's linear, you kind of know there's kind of a left side and a right side, correct? And so you have some kind of reference. When there's a circle, it's kind of hard to possibly have some reference point or what I call a fixed point. Uh, that's another one of the things that I kind of call it that. That's not a technical term by any means, but that's kind of more of what I use that as a term for us to, to work with. So if, for example, right here we had eight toppings for pizza, they were placed on a revolving tray, perhaps it looks something like that. Uh, so they all look the same, right? Now obviously if mushrooms was in one of them and pepperonis was in another one, you'd be able to tell what it was. But it's very hard to figure out how many ways I can arrange them. Because when you do arrangements, you figure out what's next to what, right? So is the pepperoni next to the mushrooms, the mushroom next to the sauce, you know, what is next to what things? And so right here, let's say this is just something you could spin. Is there any maybe like starting point or ending point that you can tell? No. And so what you have to do, if there's no reference point, which there isn't according to mine, maybe if there was a handle on here, we could use the handle as a reference point, correct? But I'm saying there isn't a handle. And so what we kind of have to do is we have to sacrifice one of the toppings in this case. We're not going to throw them out. We just have to kind of sacrifice. So perhaps we say pepperoni is in this one. All right. Right. We're going to sacrifice that one and say, I'm going to tell you where all the other toppings are based on how far they are away from pepperoni. And you either pick clockwise or counterclockwise. Right. So how many options do I have for that container? It's like a little container for the toppings. How many options are there? If I have eight toppings total, I've kind of sacrificed one of them. So there are seven options that could go in that spot, correct? Now in the next, so I put something in there, right? So what goes in the next slot? Six. Now do you have to go around the circle the way I'm going? No, if you want to go, you know, clockwise, that's or counterclockwise, excuse me, that's fine. I'm just going this way. So then there's five, and then there's four, there's three, there's two, then there's one. Here's kind of how I look at it. If I could cut this right here and unroll it, do you see how that turns into linear? It's just a line. But I don't have that, do I? When it's a line, you have a left side and a right side. But here I don't. And so what you do is, see, I don't have what I call a fixed point. I have to sacrifice something to be the fixed point. And so in other words, to figure out this, I just have to take seven factorial, correct? Do you see how these slots are kind of like your blanks? Okay. So it's seven factorial, which ends up being How much? A very, very common answer. Comes up a lot. Okay. I know there's eight toppings, so why is it seven? Because kind of one got sacrificed to be the fixed point. Okay. So that should always be your first question. Do I have a fixed point or not? Do I have a reference point? And if you don't, something's got to get sacrificed. How about here? You might want to draw a picture. We have three men and three women that must be seated alternately around the table. And it's a round table, I will tell you. Because having a rectangular table wouldn't make much sense in circular permutations. So we have people sitting in these those little square looking things or chairs, if you can tell. We have three men and three women, they must be seated alternately around the table. If it's a round table like that, do we have a reference point or a fixed point is what I call it. We don't. So what did I tell you to do? You got to sacrifice one. And we'll be nice to the ladies today and we'll sacrifice one of the males. All right? So we'll put a male right there and he just got sacrificed. For us to have a reference point. Then we know what has to go here. According to this, they have to be seated alternately. So this must be a female. Now, how many choices do I have for that spot then? I have three females, right? Still left. So I have three options for that seat. What has to go in this seat? This next one down here. Male. And how many options do I have? Be careful. Two. Very, you know what a lot of people want to put there? They want to put three. Right? And do we have three? Not really, because that one right there is kind of a bad choice of words with sacrifice in this case, right? But it is sacrificed. And so there's two options. This has to be female. And so two. This one has to be male. So one. And then female and it's the only one left standing. Right? The only one left, there's only one. And so you could kind of look at this type of problem as three factorial times 
coup factorial, right? You see where I got those from? Because it's the 3, 2, 1 for the females, and then the 2, 1 for the males. That kind of takes into consideration that one you used as a reference point. Because we didn't really have one. So 3 factorial is what? 3 times 2 times 1, so that's what? 6. And 2 factorial is just 2. So how many ways? 12. Now, of course, I could change this by just saying, how many ways could I seek the people, period? Meaning they don't have to be alternate. Would that be more or less? If I could just put them wherever, would that be more possibilities or fewer? More? Do you think quite a few? Yeah, well, let's just talk about that one real quick. Let's say I didn't say they had to be alternate. Would you still have to sacrifice somebody? Yeah. And then you would have how many options? Five, four, the right? You'd have a lot more. So basically, be uh, five factorial in that case, which is 120. Okay, so that by a factor of 10, <laughs> right, it changed. Okay? Any questions on this so far? Okay. These aren't bad because, again, no fixed point. And if you, had, if you have a fixed point, do you need to sacrifice? No. If you have some kind of fixed point, you don't need to sacrifice. Okay? All right, here's where things can get interesting. So here's where it would be very good to pay attention. Some circular objects, which actually cause most of the problem here, our objects, the way I teach it, is that can be turned over. Okay. They create what are called reflections. Basically, well, let me do this. Do you agree that if I took this one on the left and flipped it over, it would kind of look like that? Wait, I had it right the first time. It would look like that, correct? If I flipped it over? Now, the tricky part here is if you can do that, there are a lot of times you have to divide by two. Because here's why. Look at the one on the left. Do you agree that the red is between the blue and the green? Look at the one on the right. The red is between the green and the blue, right? So isn't it between the same two beads? Or whatever you want to call them? How about uh, on that one on the left? Green is between blue and red. Isn't it still between blue and red over here? So you see how a lot of duplications happen if you have a circular that can be flipped over? And the reason I use the ones that can be flipped over is because, let's face it, you're not going to flip over that table we had in the last problem. Right? You're not going to have a different orientation, correct? And if you flip over the tray of pizza toppings, it's just going to be all over the floor, so who cares, right? And so this is when it matters. So what if I do that? Does that count as different? On the one on the left, it is blue be between red and green. How about the one on the right? Hmm, it's between the same two, isn't it? So is that different? Well, we're not going to talk clockwise or counterclockwise. Is it between the same two beads? So if you have three beads on a charm, or on a charm bracelet, or three beads on a bead bracelet, probably, right? And there's no clasp, right? Maybe one of those stretchy ones? Is there a fixed point then? OK, there's no fixed point on that, right? So what do you have to do? You have to sacrifice one, right? Uh, the red, you're getting sacrificed. So how many options do I have here? I either have what goes here, either the green or blue. So that's how many options? Two, and then there's only one left. You don't have to write this one down. We'll do a bunch of examples. So I would take two times one, which is two. But according to this, I'm supposed to divide by two. So if you have three beads with no class, how many ways can you put them on there? One. Because no matter where I put these things, are the same beads next to the same beads. So does that count as a different arrangement? If the same beads are all still touching the same beads? No, it does not count as different. Okay. So in essence, if you can flip it over, just divide by two, and you'll be fine. So let's try one. First question, if I have keys on a keychain, can I kind of flip that over and look at it from the other side? Yep, so this counts as a reflection. So we know we're going to divide by two. So there are my six keys right there. Now, you could argue both ways on the whole fixed point thing here, right? For a keychain, what do you think? Is there a fixed point on a keychain? Is there a reference point you can use? Some say yes, some say no. You have to argue it. Where you put the keys on, doesn't that look different from the rest of the circle? So could you use that as a reference point? Yeah, so let's say that thing is right about here. So that's where you put the keys on, all right? So do I have to sacrifice one if I can reference that and then tell me where everything is? No, I don't have to. Now, what if you were to argue that there isn't a fixed point? Then you would do the problem differently and be prepared to argue it. 
Okay? Know why you did what you did. So how many options do I have for this first bead where I, pur I have a purple one, but how many options do I have? I have six options, right? And then where the yellow one is, I could actually put five different beads, followed by four, and then three, and then two, and then one. So is the answer to this problem whatever six factorial is? If you give me that, you're going to give me too many or too few? Too many because you're going to duplicate a lot of them. Okay. So what you have to do is divide by two. So take six factorial and divide it by two because it is something you can flip over. It has been argued by me that there is a fixed point. So six factorial divided by two. Oh, you have it? What do you got? 360? So we went from having only one choice, right, in the last one, to 360 choices. So normally what I do when I do these problems, the very first question I ask myself, that's the first thing I ask. And based on the way that I argued this one, we would say what in this case? We would say yes. Okay. And then I decide, I said, okay, I got that, so let's get the order. And then the last thing I do is decide, could I flip it over? And if I can, divide by two. Any questions so far? So how many ways can five charms be placed on a bracelet if it has a clasp? That right there is my clasp. That's that little pincher thing that lets you open and close it, right? That's why bracelets are the best example of how you can take something that's circular, unclasp it, and make it linear, right? That's the best example. So that clasp is acting as what? Fixed point. So if I were to ask that question, you would say fixed point, and you would say, yes, it's the clasp. So how many possibilities do I have for this? What color is that, orange? How many possibilities for the orange bead, then? Five. Do I have to sacrifice the orange bead? No. There's a clasp there. That's giving me a reference. So then there's four, then there's three, then there's two, then there's one. And so five factorial, then, must be the answer to this question, correct? Nope. You have to divide by two, because, again, it is a bracelet, so you can flip it over and have a different orientation to it. Okay. You would duplicate too many if you left it as just five factorial. I think 5 factorial is 120, correct? And so we divide that by 2, we get 60. Okay. Any questions so far? I believe there is just one more. Is that correct? Okay, why don't you try that one right now? All right, I saw quite a few correct answers out there. I did see a few that were uh, slightly incorrect, but very close. Does the fact of it having a clasp or not, does the clasp decide whether or not it is a reflection or not? No, reflection is decided of whether or not you can physically do what? Flip it over. That's the easiest way I can teach it to you. And this is a bracelet. So is it physically something I can flip over? Yes. So this will be divided by two. But again, the very first thing I like to ask is fixed point. It doesn't have a clasp. So we have to make a fixed point or sacrifice one. And we'll just go somewhere different. Than this. Let's sacrifice that one. Just to show you that it really doesn't matter where you go or which direction you go. It still works. And let's go uh, the other way this time. And so there are how many brace possibilities left? Four followed by three, two, one. And so we have four factorial, basically, which we do have to divide by two. And so four times three times, well, just four times three would be the easiest way, correct? is 12. Okay. So those of you that got 24, remember it's not the clasp that decides whether it's a reflection or not. The clasp decides whether you have to sacrifice one or not. Okay, so look for a fixed point, and if you have one, then you don't have to sacrifice. Okay. But if it is something you can flip over, you're good. And remember, the reason we didn't do it on the first couple is we're not going to flip over a table, you know, unless you're mad, I guess. And you're not going to you know, flip over certain, certain things like the tray or things like that. You're not going to look at it from a different orientation. You know. so, any questions on circular permutations? Okay, in your homework today, you are going to have a combination of circular and linear. It is your job to distinguish which one you have to do. Uh, when it's circular, you have to figure out fixed point, reflection. If it's linear, do you have to worry about a reflection? No. If it's linear, do you have to worry about a fixed point? No, because we just think left to right. We kind of have some kind of orientation already, so you don't have to worry about it. 